Welcome to the Remembering a Life podcast. I'm your host, Holly Ignatowski. Today, we're talking with Lauren Rhodes, author, editor, and cemetery expert. Lauren is the author of 199 Cemeteries to See Before You Die, Wish You Were Here, Adventures in Cemetery Travel, and co-author of Spooky Writer's Planner, This Morbid Life, a memoir composed of 45 death-positive essays, won a gold medal from the Independent Publisher Book Awards in 2022. Welcome, Lauren. It's so great to have you with us today. Thank you so much for having me. So, Lauren, cemeteries. How do you become a cemetery expert, and why? For me, it was totally by accident. Um, I, I ended up traveling to London completely unplanned, and while we were there, I discovered this beautiful book of cemetery photos. And uh, my husband and I, you know, didn't have anything planned in advance, so we were flipping through the book, and he said, you know, I'd, I'd kind of like to see that place. So we, that was our introduction to Highgate Cemetery. Uh, I was there in 1991, so it was about 10 years after the Friends of Highgate took over, and they were still in the midst of getting things under control after the cemetery had been abandoned. So it was not at all like my conception of the cemeteries I grew up with in the Midwest were you know, granite headstones and manicured uh, lawnmowers, you know, grass was beautifully green, all of that, and Highgate was nothing like any of those things. So it was the first time I realized that cemeteries aren't permanent and if I cared about them, maybe I should do something to get other people to care about them. And if we all cared about them, maybe we could save them. What was it like? What? Why was it different? Well, uh, at that point, it was January, so it was very cold. Nothing was blooming. But ivy had just grown wild over everything. And so you'd come around the corner and there'd be an angel, but all you could see was maybe her face or one arm pointing up. Hmm. Completely overgrown. Trees had come down and they'd knock stones over and uh, it was like a colony of feral cats roaming around. It was it was unlike anything I'd ever seen before. And from that point, you decided you wanted to look into cemeteries and discover more about them? Yeah, I had already had plans at that point to go on to Paris. And a friend told me, you absolutely have to see Père Lachaise. And, you know, I had no idea what that entailed, but it was it was beautiful in its own way. Père Lachaise was in better shape than London, but somebody had gone through and chalked Jim and an arrow on, I don't know, it wasn't every stone in the cemetery, but thousands of stones in the cemetery. And I thought, who, who would do that sort of thing? You know, I understand making the pilgrimage to see Jim Morrison's grave, but but the disrespect of marking all the rest of the stones. And I thought, you know, people need to be educated. They need to care about these places. So it's kind of been my mission ever since. Hmm. Tell us about your travels and how you you came up with your list of not 200, but 199 cemeteries (laughs) to see before you die. What was the criteria for making your book? Well, I started blogging about cemeteries in 2011, and I... I had always kind of had in the back of my mind uh, the top things that people should see. Just from my reading, uh, cemeteries that kept coming up or places that were, you know, remarkably beautiful or historically important or whatever. And so I, I kind of kept a running tally. But then in 2016, I was approached by Black Dog and Leventhal, who asked, would you be interested in writing a book for us? And the first thing I pitched was 99 cemeteries to see before you die. And uh, <laughs> they had been thinking exactly along those lines. You know, they'd even batted that same title around. So, so it was a meeting of minds right away. But as soon as I sat down to make the list, clearly 99 was not going to be enough. And as it turns out, 199 is not enough. <laughs> I had to leave so many things off my list. In terms of criteria, I looked for places that welcome visitors. There were a lot of things I wanted to include that were either too fragile to visit or didn't have open hours or consider themselves family burial grounds and, and didn't want people tromping through. And, you know, I, I completely respect that. But I wanted to have as big a variety as possible 
both in terms of statuary and history and famous people and places that um, were historically important, like Mount Auburn, um, which represents the shift in how people were buried in this country. And, you know, places that were fun, that would be fun to see. You mentioned Mount Auburn and and the shift in the way people were buried. Can you talk about that? What does that mean? Well, before Mount Auburn was founded, people in America were pretty much buried in churchyards if they lived in town or if they lived out in the countryside, they had a family plot on their property. Graves weren't considered to be permanently marked. You know, stones were created and if they survived, that was great, but that was not the intent of the stone. They weren't really meant to outlive the people who would remember the person who was buried. But then Mount Auburn changed everything in this country when they started marketing family plots. So in a churchyard, you were buried as you fell, pretty much. So, you know, mom might be here and dad might be here and the kids might be buried someplace else in the churchyard. But at Mount Auburn, you could buy a plot for several generations to be buried together, put up a, what was intended to be a permanent marker to your family name, and then every grave within that plot would have a stone that said mother or daughter or whatever and, and um, indicate each person buried there. And so you could stand at the grave of that person and everyone was buried together. And that was a new thing, Grove Street Cemetery in Connecticut had done the same thing on a smaller scale, but Mount Auburn was at that time what was considered to be a huge cemetery, and it's it's exquisitely beautiful. It's um, rolling land. They put in winding paths and carriage paths so you could see the plantings and see the statuary, and they had a, a horticultural society on site selling trees and bushes and things. So it was designed to be as beautiful as possible. And people were expected to come and visit whether they had family buried there or not, just to see how beautiful it was. With that in mind, with that shift, how do cemeteries help us to remember our loved ones who have passed? And can they help us through the grief process? For myself, I, it's been really crucial to have a a place of memory, a place where I can go and, and talk to my loved ones. Um, I can't go to their homes anymore, and I've been forced to let go of most of their stuff. So I have my photographs and my memories, but when I stand at a grave site, I feel like I can, I can sense their love and their presence again. And I think that's really crucial, just to, to have a dedicated place where you can connect with that person again. Um, and I know it, your relationship with the grave changes over time. At first, when my brother died, it was really painful to see his stone. But, you know, now I, whenever I'm home, I like to go and catch him up on things and, and just talk to him. Uh, you know, I don't believe he's in the grave. I don't know that he's in the air or anything like that. But it's it's important to me to feel like we're still brother and sister after all these years. Is there a way to make that visit to a loved one's grave more meaningful? Oftentimes, if they're buried uh, underground, we can leave flowers or some kind of memento. But a lot of people are buried, say, in crypts that are too high to reach. How do we make that visit meaningful for ourselves? Well, I know the crypts here in, in California often have a uh, tool that you can reach up so you can still place a vase even if the niche is up over your head. And I think it's important to leave notes or flowers or decorate for the holidays if the cemeteries allow that sort of thing, just to, to continue that sense of family and, and the bond going forward. Have you been to all of the cemeteries in your book or have you visited many of them? About 60 of them a little more than 60. Uh, the rest are kind of an aspirational list. And I had great plans for traveling the last couple of years, and that's kind of fitting into. So now I'm going to have to pick up the pace if I'm going to see them all. Do you have a favorite cemetery among the ones that you have visited? Oh, my goodness. It, it changes. Um, one of my favorites is a, a little place in Flint, Michigan called Sunset Hills that has 
just this amazing sculpture garden. Uh, one of the sculptures is full size, life size, crack the whip sculpture, and it's I think it's seven kids holding hands, and the last one in line is being pulled off her feet because the other kids are running so fast. She's lost a sandal, and it's separate from the sculpture in the grass. It's so charming. And uh, among their sculptures, there's a, a grandfather and a granddaughter sharing, I think it's a Hershey bar. Hmm. Um, and they look like real people. And as you drive around the cemetery, you, you look as, it looks as though you're seeing mourners, but it's this wonderful sculpture garden. It tells a story. It really does. Yeah, and I think it means something different to every person, which, you know, is probably the best use of art there is. Cemeteries can give us a little bit better understanding of the history of our own families and other families as well. Talk about how that happens, how they tell a story of the culture or the place, the time. You can learn a lot just walking around a cemetery. I discovered the Spanish flu by walking through a cemetery and seeing grave after grave with 1918 on it. And I, you know, I knew that was World War I, but it, women and children were dying in 1918. What did that mean? And at the same time, if you go and look at the iconography on graves, uh, mm -hmm. the Victorians had this whole language of flowers where, you know, the sunflower meant one thing and a rose meant something else, and a fern had a specific meaning. So if you decipher all of that, you can learn a lot about the story being told by that gravestone. But even now, the little graveyard where my brother's buried is a little country graveyard. But some of the stones have uh, aerial photos of the farms on it. Some of them have recipes on it. Uh, there's a sense that grandparents are still teaching the descendants and I think you can just learn a lot between what people choose as an epitaph and what people choose, uh, what words they choose to remember somebody by. I'm trying to remember now what my brother says. It's something about we loved him a lot. Well, his his death was sudden, and those words didn't get to be spoken. And I think that's one of the things that cemeteries remind us is that life is short. No man knows the hour, all of that. But if there's something you need to say to somebody, you need to say it now. You know, if there's something you want to do, you have to do it now. Don't wait, because we don't know what's going to happen. And I, I find that reminder really comforting. And we're all across the world in the same boat. We may pretend that things are going to continue to be wonderful forever, but, but really the, we need to do the things we need to do at this moment and not wait. And the other thing cemeteries remind me is every day above ground is a good day. It doesn't matter if the news is bleak and you stub your toe or, you know, something happens. You're still alive, and that's wonderful and positive and cause for hope. Do you have a favorite time of day to visit a cemetery? I am super allergic to mosquitoes. Oh. <laughs> so I like to go in the middle of the day. Um, I really like to hear birds singing when I'm in a cemetery. And so, yeah, midday is, is pretty much my favorite time. Your newest book, Death's Garden Revisited, Personal Relationships with Cemeteries, is due out this month in September. And it's a collection of essays from cemetery docents, tourists, genealogies, urban explorers, and ghost hunters, and even more. How do you find the contributors for this collection? Are you Googling ghost hunter? <laughs> No, I pretty much just put the word out. Um, some of the people in the book are people I've worked with on other projects. Uh, some of them wrote pieces for my cemetery travel blog. A couple of them were horror writers who filled in for me. Uh, I write a cemetery column for the Horror Writers Association. And so I had a couple of writers step in for me when I had to be away. And then other people just heard about the project and were really excited and had good stories to tell. So it, it kind of grew organically, but I'm really pleased with how it turned out. You say in the intro to the book, cemeteries as we know them are more ephemeral than they look. What did you mean by that? Well, I was thinking of Highgate, um, but also there have been a number of cemeteries in the news lately where I'm thinking in Florida where they've opened the ground and found 
um, historical black cemeteries that were forgotten. And I, that's true in San Francisco as well. We used to have an enormous cemetery complex, which was all removed by the 1940s. And they continue to turn up bodies that were missed. It was just a couple of years ago, there was a, a little girl buried in an iron coffin that somebody found in her backyard when she was doing some yard work. So we think of cemeteries as sort of monolithic and permanent and all of that, but really all it takes is some kids with a baseball bat or a tornado to knock a tree down, and the stones that we thought were permanent are, are irrevocably damaged. So it's I just it goes back to everything I've done with my cemetery work. Is it's important for people to care about these places and to get them the care they have to visit. People take care of things that they visit and love. Cemeteries often have a reputation for being creepy, haunted places. We talked about ghosts, and they become very popular at Halloween. Yet they can also be places of beauty and peace, as you've said. You say you want to reclaim the beauty, peace, and healing that we can experience from visiting cemeteries. How do we do that? How do we care for them? How do we experience that? In pretty much every cemetery I've been to, if you go into the office, and you ask the office people, you know, can they tell you what you should see? Is there something beautiful? Is there someone famous? Cemetery people are the nicest people I've ever met, to be mm-hmm. honest. But they're excited to tell you. I often ask groundskeepers, you know, do you have a favorite grave? Do you have a favorite story? And they will take me and, you know, tell me everything they know about this person. And I, I think that's really cool. You know, I, I think a gift to have people who care about cemeteries in that way and are happy to share them. But so many places, especially this time of year, have tours where it's either the local historical society or um, I know one of the local cemeteries here has the uh, high school drama club dressing up as people who are buried in the cemetery and telling their stories. And I think that's a good introduction. It's a way of and demystifying them and making them less spooky. I I personally like the ghost story aspect, just in terms of folklore and keeping stories alive, but I know some cemeteries are uncomfortable with that. As a visitor, I think you have to respect whatever the cemetery rules are. Do you have a ghost story that you can share with us? I've never had a ghostly experience in a cemetery. Uh, I've had some some creepy kind of unexplained things happen. I did a tour with a docent of Mountain View Cemetery over in Oakland, California, a couple of years ago, and we were seeing all kinds of strange lights zipping around in the dark, and uh, I, I really don't have an explanation for what we saw, but uh, nothing jumped out and went boo either. So I, <laughs> I, whether it was a ghost or some weird trick of the light, I don't know. Hmm. But I'm willing to go and look again. (laughs) Uh Uh-huh. One of the stories in your book really touched me. It's called How the Forgotten Angels Saved My Life. A Marion Rich, I believe, was the author of this story. And her cemetery experience helped her out of a deep depression. Do you remember that story? Can you talk about it? Yeah. That's one of my favorites. She'd gotten to a point in her life where she was working kind of a dead-end job and Things had not worked out after college the way she expected, and she was kind of footloose when she discovered St. Stephen's, and uh, there was a a baby land, which was a common thing. I don't see them so much anymore, but it used to be common for cemeteries to set aside a, a plot where babies could be buried for cheaper than the cost of a normal grave would be, and in this cemetery, Emory and started picking up grapes, started collecting beer bottles and trimming the flowers and not going as far as cleaning stones or doing anything to to repair the statuary, but just to tidy the place up and spend time there. And it gave her a purpose. It gave her something to do. And in the end, she, she felt like she had accomplished everything she could for these four children that didn't have anyone to care for their grapes anymore and moved on, you know, recovered from her depression and and was able to go on with her life. But 
for the moment, she really needed something, and she felt that these children in their forgotten grades really needed her, and they helped each other. You know, whether you believe that the children were actually participating in that or not, it was important to Emory and to feel that they were. She had a very interesting experience after many months of doing this, and she felt like she was coming out of her depression, uh, and she could maybe stop doing this, but she felt guilty about it. Can you talk about what happened to help her through that? Well, the very last day she was there, she she was crying because she felt like she was abandoning these poor kids that had already been abandoned. But the wind shifted, and she saw something that she interpreted it as an angel giving her leave to go to say, you know, somebody else was watching over these children now, and they would be okay without her. And it's it's the sort of thing where in the story she doesn't say it was a ghost. She doesn't say it was an angel. But she saw something, and that was what was important. And, and I think often that's the way ghost stories are, is, it doesn't matter if it's a ghost or your imagination. What matters is you feel loved and you get the message that it's okay to move on. And I think that's really beautiful, whether it's an actual spooky ghost or, you know, something more ephemeral than that. I loved her takeaway message at the end of the story. She says, although some people think cemeteries are depressing, they can bring you peace. Whether you just go to look at the beautiful statuary, or if you find a personal message specifically for you. Don't be scared to explore and allow yourself the ability to heal, like I did, through honoring the dead. Is that what you're telling us? Is that your message in your book, that we can experience healing in these cemeteries? I think so, yeah. yeah. I, I think, you know, people not that long ago, used to go to cemeteries for picnics or to read poetry or just to sunbathe or, you know, smell the flowers, that sort of thing. And I don't know, it hasn't even been 100 years, but we've gotten to a point now where people have actually asked me, is it okay to go, go to a cemetery where I don't have family buried? Yes, yes. If you don't visit, it's not going to survive. So I think we need cemeteries and they need us. I guess that's my takeaway message. Hmm. Any other stories that really stand out for you in the book? Oh my. It's like picking one of my favorite children. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, geez. There, there's so many that I love in here. Um, Sarah Lisa, I'm so duo, uh, which I'm probably horribly mangling her name, but she wrote a piece about going to visit Sacagawea's grave, and it's um, couched in amongst, she's indigenous Mexican, and uh, she's working to uh, heal that community. So she talks about her family and their history in this country and the graves that have been lost and the graves that they know of that they can't visit, it's not safe for them to visit. And in amongst all of this, she goes to Sacagawea's grave. And there's there's so much to think about in that one essay. I mean, it's probably only a thousand words, but she talks about 200 years of American history in a way that I haven't seen handled before. I think that piece is, that, that piece is really beautiful. Um, oh, goodness. There's, there's so many um, family stories. Uh, Angela Yorko Smith performed a wedding in the cemetery in Missouri. Um, during, at the height of the pandemic, they needed a place where people could stand outside and there was a sense of thing to do. It's, it's beautiful. There, that's, it also has a ghost story attached to that story. But, um, yeah, I'm sorry. There is a lot of stories in the book that, that I really love, and it, it is hard to pick one out. That's quite all right. It's a, it's a beautiful book, Death's Garden Revisited, Personal Relationships with Cemetery, as we said, it's due out this month in September. So um, recommend that people pick it up. And I have to ask you, uh, we ask all of our guests, Lauren, who are you remembering today? I'm remembering my brother. I've talked a little bit about him already, but he, he died 20 years ago this summer, this last summer, and his birthday is going to be in October. And, you know, in 20 years' time, you think you'd get used to the loss, but I still 
I miss our epic phone call. He was a big, early guy who liked to camp and go fishing and snowmobile and all of that. And he'd tell me these wonderful stories about being out in the north woods of Michigan and seeing a bobcat cross the trail or something like that. And he had, he had such a gift of telling a story and making you feel like you were there. So I'd like to, I'd like to remember him today. Thank you for asking. Hmm. Thank you so much for joining us, Lauren, and for this beautiful book and giving us a fresh new perspective on cemeteries and their healing powers and why it's important for us to take care of them and for these amazing stories. Thank you for sharing. Thank you so much for having me. To learn more about Lauren Rhodes, visit the podcast page on rememberingalife.com. And to enter to win a copy of Lauren's newest book, Death's Garden Revisited, personal relationships with cemeteries, visit rememberingalife.com slash giveaways.